Welcome to the Spooky Tales podcast presented by me, John. And me, Louise. We have been fascinated by spooky goings on since we can remember and wanted to share with you the stories that pique our interest. Today's stories of hauntings, possession, poltergeist, psychological manipulation and an unexpected twist. It's the spooky tale of the ghosts of Cambridge. Welcome, or welcome back, to the Spooky Tales podcast. While we've had a break, we really appreciated all the lovely reviews and chatting to some of you on Instagram. Big shout outs to Mike, Zoe and Evie of the Stories of Strangeness podcast. Big shout outs to Amy and also to Chris and Jen. Chris is an excellent purveyor of folklore and history on Instagram and I encourage you to follow him on Instagram at Sim Britannia. So, John, what's this spooky tale all about? This spooky tale is of ghosts of Cambridge in the east of Britain. We are indebted to Robert Halliday, Alan Murdy and Jeff Yeats for their diligent work, without which we could not bring you these Cambridge tales. Links to their work will be in the show notes. Alan is a well-known contributor to the wonderful magazine The Fortune Times, as well as a member for the Society of, and Chairman, or at least was, of the Ghost Club founded in Cambridge in the 19th century. Wow. Now, let me guess. Cambridge is one of the most haunted cities in Britain. Yes, along with all the other cities, that is. Although Cambridge is famous for its historic university going back to 800 AD. I think there are 39 colleges, probably all with a resident ghost or two. So I guess there's plenty of history and academics to take an interest in document the sightings. Absolutely. Indeed, some have used the historical building for their fictional ghost stories. Ooh, do you mean M.R. James? Yes, we'll come to him shortly. First, let us delve into the ghosts of Cambridge University and its colleges. We'll start with King's College. Oh, yes, such beautiful buildings, particularly from the backs. You might need to explain what the backs are. Well, the backs are simply the backs of the colleges. However, there is a line of colleges and it's King's and it's Queen's and uh, not John's. What's the other one that it comes along straight after? There's Gonville and Keys as well. So there's a line of colleges and... They, uh, the back of the colleges were not built on at all. They were built on, the college owns most of Cambridge. So uh, because the college owns most of Cambridge, they kept the backs of the colleges open um, and there are routes through to get to the, the front of the colleges, which the public can walk as well. But it is this most beautiful, probably quarter of a mile, half a mile stretch where you can just see these most magnificent buildings. And you can see the backs and you see the manicured lawns and it is known as the backs because it's a really famous part of Cambridge that that people like to walk. And when you see pictures of Cambridge with the manicured lawns, what you are seeing is actually the backs of the colleges, not the fronts. King's College Chapel was built in the 15th century and as well as being famous for its medieval architecture and stained glass windows, it also stages a world famous carol service which is broadcast globally to millions. There are some that feel that Christmas hasn't started properly until they've watched the carols from Kings on Christmas Eve and if you want to go you need to wait outside. Well you did before these unprecedented Covid times. You would go and wait and you have to go and wait if you want as a member of the public to go and get a a seat in the chapel. Okay, you couldn't just get a ticket then? No, you can't get, just get a ticket. I mean, I do think there are tickets available and there have been, but you can actually queue up to get in, but you have to be there the day before and you have to queue all overnight. Ah, uh, okay. Right, well, I'm not sure I'd be one of uh, one of those. Uh, for me, Christmas starts when the lights and the decorations go up in the house for me. Mm, yeah, quite right too. So, does Kings have any ghosts? Oh, yes. There is a shadowy phantom who has been seen among the rooftop pinnacles. Legend has it that he was a victim of a student prank which entailed placing objects near the pinnacles. Annoyingly, I couldn't find out if he fell to his death or was just really not happy that he was pranked and so haunted the place. 
An employee of the college back in 1900 heard horses in the chapel, possibly a ghostly playback from the Civil War when the Roundheads used the chapel as stables. Ah, via the stone tape theory, that stone in particular absorbs and traps certain events and sounds, recorded if you like, which are stored in the material, stone for example, and then are played back in certain conditions. Yes, one of the theories put forward for the strange happenings surrounding the Hexham Heads, which we discussed in our first episode. That would be an amazing thought, wouldn't it? If you're in a big stone building and you hear and see past events, like in this case, horses coming from the past, or in the case of Harry Marindale, a legion of Roman soldiers. Oh yes, that was in York, wasn't it? He was doing some work in the basement, wasn't he? Yes, he was upgrading the plumbing at Treasury House. That's right. Now, he first heard a sound. Yes, a trumpet sound, which got louder and louder. Then a fully uniformed Roman soldier walked through the the wall right beneath him as he was on a ladder not just that sounded really weird. <laughs> so so he was on a ladder hmm. and then a fully uniformed roman soldier walked through the wall right beneath him which was followed by a cart and a horse actually a horse and then a cart <laughs> <laughs> yes yes that would make more sense yeah it? which was followed <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of the legion marching in pairs. So it was Roman soldier. God, how freaky out would that be? I just, I just think that would be amazing. He was so terrified at what he was seeing, he fell off the ladder and cowered in the corner. At first, Harry could only see the Roman soldiers from the knees up. Oh yes, Harry was ridiculed at first. But years later, when they did excavations, he was vindicated as they discovered a Roman road passing through Treasury House, about 18 inches below the floor where Harry had been working. Also, excavations confirmed some of the details Harry had given on the soldier's attire. Anyway, how did we end up in York? Oh yes, stone tape theory and horses heard in King's College Chapel. Now, King's College was where M. R. James studied and worked. He was intending to become a clergyman like his father, but was such a brilliant student that they asked him to join the staff. M. R. James is said to be one of the finest authors of fictional ghost stories in the English language. It is said his interests in ghosts and horror stemmed from a spooky encounter he had as a child in a rectory where he lived in the village of Great Livermere in Suffolk. Great Livermere is another one of those reputably most haunted villages in England, and there are regular ghost-offs with the village of Borley just down the road in Essex. Really? No, but there should be. I think that could be another reality ghost programme. Ghost Off. This week in Ghost Off, Great Livermere takes on Borley for the title of Most Haunted Village in England. Last week, Borley and Essex defeated Pluckley in Kent. The winner is going on to the International Ghost Off Finals in the Fall River, Massachusetts. OK, OK, OK. We went to Borley, didn't we? We must have gone through Livermere. No, we didn't. No, we haven't. Neither. We haven't been there. No, we have been to Borley. Have we? we? Yeah, we went to the rectory, do you remember? Which is no longer there. Yeah, I think you went with your other husband. No, 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 I went with you. Did you? Yes, we went. And we went instead and we were like, well, that's not very scary. And then we <laughs> discovered that we were staring at the wrong house. We were just staring randomly at our house. <laughs> I'm going, I don't feel a lot. I was obviously so traumatic, I blotted that from my memory. Yeah, no, we went out. We went. We did a little drive round. You know, one of our drive rounds, speaking yes, places. Yes. Yeah. And we went to Bortley and we literally were stood out we must car. have flashed through it then it is super small yeah and then afterwards because i was like i was convinced it was in a pub and you were like no it's in a rectory and then we realized we were both being just staring at a house ah. and the reason that we hadn't felt anything was it was just a house in Borley. because <laughs> it's no longer there is it the rectory is no longer there no no it burned down in 1944 yeah there you go anyway M. R. james as a child spooky encounter yes yes uh mr not Mr. James. <laughs> right. Anyway, Mr. James. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. James. <laughs> anyway, Mr. James as a child. Spooky encounter? Yes. Mr. James, as a young lad living in the rectory as his father was a clergyman, one night went to the bedroom window and sees something in the garden. This shadowy figure starts moving towards the house and then he hears footsteps up the stairs and the handle of his bedroom door starts to turn. And what happened? He woke up. It had been a nightmare. Oh! However, 
He keeps having the same nightmare and wonders if something terrible has happened there. One time, after another nightmare of the shadowy figure in the garden, the brave young M. R. James goes into the garden to investigate. There, in a hole in the garden gate, is a pair of terrifying, malevolent, dark eyes looking straight at him. James fled, but looked back, seeing a shadowy figure slither away through the trees. Ooh. M. R. James was no fantasist. He became vice-chancellor and wrote over 200 books and articles on paleography which is the uh, study of ancient writing systems and the deciphering and dating of historical manuscripts. Can you tell I looked that up? Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you had a different voice. You had your Wikipedia voice. <laughs> However, it is his 30 fictional ghost stories for which he is most known. His first stories in the 1890s were read to college friends, later telling his stories by candlelight every Christmas. He pioneered a realistic style rather than the heavy Gothic style of ghost stories up to that point. His stories were less blood and guts, and more the creation of a fusion of everyday reality slipping into an enveloping other world. It sounds amazing, but it is that kind of everyday reality that makes it more spooky. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because you can feel that you could, it's just that kind of stepping sideways into a different reality. But it's so close you don't notice you've stepped sideways. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, uh, what, was the, what was the, um, Jonathan Carroll? He yeah. did something similar, didn't he? Yes, yes. I can't remember what it's called, it's called a particular type of fantasy. Ah, uh, yes. Okie dokie. Yeah, so I shall do a separate episode where I'll read one of his stories, which will go out roughly the same time as this episode. M. R. James was convinced of the presence of ghosts at Kings. There was an eccentric and morbid academic called Barrett, who lived in the Gibbs building, facing the Cam River. He kept a coffin in his room. Ooh, why? Doesn't say. However, it was rumoured that dark forces haunted him. He started to meddle in the dark arts, so to speak. And he had terrible bad luck, losing most of his money and became a worried and frightened man. One night, terrifying screams were heard from his room, and the next morning, he was found dead, laid in his coffin by the spiritual entities that he is said to have communicated with. On the anniversary of his death, every year, his screams can be heard coming from his room. The next morning? They went in the next morning? So they heard terrifying screams and waited until the next morning to see if he was all right? With friends like that? Indeed, I'm not sure he was many people's bosom pal. From King's, we head to Magdalen College. One of Magdalen's most famous scholars was Samuel Pepys, who left his famous diaries to the college along with all his other books and manuscripts. It is reported that there is an apparition that appears nearby. In 2008, at 9.15, a member of staff was reading in one of the common rooms when he heard an owl hoot from outside. This was unusual enough for him to get up and go and investigate. He began to get a very uneasy feeling, nothing like he had experienced before. It was overwhelming enough that he decided to turn back. As he did so, he looked towards the River Cam and spotted a thinnish male figure, pale, dressed in white, and moving abnormally fast across the ground. Fast enough that he thought the figure must be running or cycling, except that there was no sound whatsoever on the gravel on which he would have been running or cycling. His sense of unease intensified when he realised the figure would have had to have passed through a locked gate in order to take the route the strange, surreal-looking figure had taken. I have seen it asked how ghosts float about downstairs through walls and locked gates, but they do not fall through the floor or the ceiling or the ground. Ah, oh, yes, good question. Was that a question? No. No. Good statement. <laughs> there was a Star Trek episode, a Star Trek uh, TNG episode. TNG? Of the, the Next Generation. Sorry, it took me a moment to remember what it, <laughs> what it was. Yeah. The Next Generation, where two members of the crew... Geordie LaForge and Ensign Rowe became out of phase, so no one could see them unless they passed through a lot of tachyon particles or something like that. They're where they appeared a lot like ghosts do. They also ran through walls, but did not fall through the floor or deck. So was there any answer to this question? 
Yes, it was suggested that because they are ghosts, being all ethereal-like, they are not subject to gravitational forces. If they walk through a wall, they are still choosing the direction they are travelling, and since the molecular structure of the wall doesn't stop them, they would in turn not need the molecular structure of the floor to support them. Ah, excellent. Case closed. Also, there's lots of theories, is it theories? I'm not sure, about the fact that the ghosts would still do what they did when they were alive. Mm -hmm. So that again, that's repeating, isn't it? Yes. So you're seeing a film from years ago, in which case they wouldn't go through the floor because they wouldn't have gone through the floor. So they're not actually corporeal, as it were, in that sense. No, exactly. Yes, exactly. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I'm not sure it does. Yeah, yes, because they're not a physical thing. Well, they are a physical thing, but they They were a physical thing. And so what you're seeing is a replay of that physical thing rather than it actually being there. You're just seeing an energetic imprint of it. Yes. And that's what the ghost is. Ah, okay. In which case it wouldn't go through the floor because you're seeing of what happened all those years ago. It might only be two weeks ago, but it was still in the past. And at, and at that time, they were not going to walk through the floors. I suppose that doesn't say why they don't. They can walk through walls. No. Unless the walls weren't there. Well, uh, yes, that's uh, that's normally the case, isn't it? People, you see people walk through walls, but actually, when they you, you know have a look at the house and they sort of decide to do something to it, they find out there was a, there was a door there. Like the Roman warriors when yes. they were walking on that road, there wasn't a basement there. No, it was a road. So uh, you're seeing the repeat. And then they built over the top of it. Yes, you've yeah. seen. So their feet were actually down on the ground level as it was in Roman times. Okay, we now moved off again. We have a bit, yes, back to New York, didn't we? Okay, so it actually, funny enough, this does remind me of a case in Cambridge, believe it or not, uh, down Hill Road. Now, do you know the naked scientists? I do, but not in the biblical sense. They are the Cambridge-based group who do podcasts and write articles and so forth. Chris Smith is the... Virologist. Is it virologist? I think so. Virologist? I think it's a virologist. Virologist, who's been on the BBC a lot during the pandemic, during these unprecedented times. Yes. Yes, he's been very good as well. Yeah. So actually, their their podcasts are excellent, and they make complicated subjects very, very accessible. And they make me feel like I'm smarter than I am. So You're very smart anyway. Well, no. But um, thumbs up for me on that one, and I'll put a link into their website in the show notes. Anyhow. Someone asked a question, this was on one of their radio shows. Oh, right. Why do ghosts float above the floor? To which you have already answered. Thank you. Case closed. However, the article never answered the question, but it did tell an interesting story. Ooh. A lady called Kareen was out trick-or-treating with her daughter and her daughter's friends on Halloween in 2003. They had a pre-arranged list of houses to visit where they generally knew the occupants. At one house on Hills Road, they were chatting with their mother and daughter at the door for some time, and after about 15 minutes, they moved on to the next house. As they were walking, Kareen asked her daughter if she knew who the shy little girl dressed in the Victorian costume was, as they had not met them before, and she was standing next to the mother and uh, daughter. So did the daughter know the shy little girl? No, the the daughter didn't know the shy little girl in the Victorian costume, but she saw her, yes. So Kareen, a few days later, Corrine asked the mother who the girl in the Victorian costume was to be told that there was no one of that description there. Yet, Corrine and her daughter had seen her for the whole time that they were there. When they asked the daughter's friends, they, like the mother and her daughter, had not seen the little girl in the Victorian dress either, which they assumed was a Halloween costume, of course. So, Corrine and her daughter saw it. Yes, but nobody else did, but including else. the mother and the daughter, who they were uh, said to have been stood next to. Oh, and had the daughter so? Oh, oh my God! And, and the, the figure had been there for sort of the whole fifteen minutes that they were sort of chatting with them at the door. And she and what she responded to them? She kind of looked at them. Or yeah, she, she looked. Was at them. She was shy. She was so shy. She, sort of, she was sort of oh. Yeah. So there was not. She didn't act weird. No. No, because it was Halloween. She was in a Victorian... I thought she was in a Victorian costume. How weird. Ooh, spooky. All right, yes. Let us visit the Old Master's Lodge at Corpus Christi College, probably the most persistently active of, of ghosts in Cambridge. Ooh, yes, go on. The Old Master's Lodge was converted into student accommodation on the upper floors and the lower floors into kitchens in the 1820s. 
These alterations seem to have set off the spirits and ghosts who, it seems, progress through a change curve like the rest of us. Why? What happened? Well, inexplicable footsteps, loud bangs, the kitchen staff would not stay at night. So convinced were they that there were ghosts in the kitchens. There were sightings of the upper part of a man or a bodiless head. In 1904, on a misty autumn morning at 5am, a student saw a man standing by his bed, who then proceeded to glide out through a shut door. Although freaked out, he managed to get back to sleep, but was reawakened by loud banging. He went to a friend's room for company. He returned to his room, which now seemed quiet. When he opened the door, however, there stood the shadowy figure by his bed once more. The student fled the rooms there and then, never to return. He was a big, a bit nesh. The shadowy figure might have wanted to make friends or, <laughs> or impart important information. Yes, good point. There are many stories of ghosts passing on messages, either those who have recently died, coming back to chide them for not having a better funeral, or just to comfort the person, to tell them they are safe and how much they are loved. Although this could be considered a crisis apparition, which is more psychological than being visited by a spirit. There are quite a few ghosts who use the telephone to speak, or even these days, by text, which completely freak out the recipient. What? Ghost texts? Yes. There are ghost texts. It was an article in the Fortune Times recently. Anyway, in October 1904, a student called Arthur Wade moved into the old lodge. He quickly made friends with the other two students, who were from King's College. Shane Leslie and John Capron. Shane, by the way, was Winston Churchill's cousin. Interesting. They all had an interest in the supernatural. However, they decided to be a bit more proactive with their interest. I'm feeling some foreboding with this, but go on, what happened? <laughs> well, they decided to try their hand at exorcism to drive away the college ghosts. OK, I, I actually thought you were going to say they had they had a seance to bring on the ghosts, but no, OK, this is, this is a twist on the usual student pranks. Straight for exorcism. Straight for exorcism. OK, yes. how? How did they do this? They used a translation of a medieval exorcism ceremony. Well, I suppose Cambridge University would be the place to find people that could easily translate a medieval exorcism and get all the pronunciations correct. Yes, that's very true. They used Arthur's room and began the ceremony at 10pm one night. Upon calling on the spirit to appear, it duly did. Wow. Forming a mist which swirled at first before taking the form of a man. OK, I'd be freaked out. Bye bye. Absolutely. They approached, they, they approached oh, the apparition, but were forced backwards before the apparition disappeared and then reappeared in the doorway, but visible only from the knees upward. Intriguing. He was wearing 17th century clothing with a rough collar and lace cuffs. He was moving as though in punishment or torment. The three terrified students were joined by others from surrounding rooms. I should imagine they were, they were drawn in by the kerfuffle. Did they see it as well? Well, sort of. They saw it disappear. John Capron said he saw it go upstairs. So they all went and charged into the room of the medical student called Hugh Milner. Oh, I bet he was impressed. <laughs> You're right. He was spitting feathers at the intrusion and the outlandish reason for it. Oh, excellent word. But then something odd happened. You mean even odder? <laughs> yes, indeed. Good point, well made. Even odder. Hugh started to mutter how cold he was, and so very icy cold at that, and then he and the three amateur exorcists collapsed to the floor. Oh my gosh. The other students, frightened out of their wits, managed to get the doctor and chaplain, who calmed everything down. Did they find out who or what the apparition was? Well, there was one related theory. Some years later, a document was discovered which described the circumstances of a death by suicide of a one Dr. Butts. Oh dear. He had hanged himself in the doorframe near where Arthur's room was. His body was found with his knees dragging on the floor in the place and the posture in which the students saw his apparition. Oh, have there been any, any sighting since of this? Indeed. Various members of staff have claimed to see something moving around the now sealed off staircase when there were rumours in the 1930s that Dr Butt's ghost was active again. The master at the time, William Spence, decided to lay down a rule that anyone who saw it would be sent down. 
The next sighting wasn't until 1967, so it must have worked then. Yeah. <laughs> when a research fellow spent Christmas in the college. On Christmas Eve, he went down to the kitchen to fetch himself a Christmas snack and was disturbed by the appearance of a half-length figure of a man floating in the kitchen. I have no idea what a half-length figure is. No? Well, it's what similar the- to the one that we were just, just discussing. Sort of, you know, not, not full length. Oh, 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 I see. <laughs> that really bit confused me. I was like, half length? Yeah, so he... But like, half of him. Like, kind of half length. Yes. But you mean cut off at the knees or something Something like that, like that. yes. Yeah. So that's so he was in the kitchen, fetching himself a Christmas snack. Yes, he, well, the, the ghost was getting his own snack. I, well, he doesn't say, but who knows? It could have been. Yeah, exactly. A bit like sort of Ghostbusters or something, yeah. yeah. Or our son. <laughs> <laughs> in the kitchen, getting himself a snack. Yes. More recently, in the 1990s and early 2000s, knockings have been heard on a regular basis. The most disturbing story from Corpus Christi was the misfortune that befell Dr. John Spencer. He was master from 1667 until his death in 1693. His wife died two years after the birth of their daughter in 1674. When their daughter, Elizabeth, was 16, she fell in love with a student James Betts. However, the master disapproved of the affair in the strongest way. One day, when Elizabeth and James were in the master's lodge, they heard the master return coming up the stairs. Fearful of the master's anger at being discovered, James hid in a cupboard. The master came in, saw Elizabeth, and ordered her to accompany him on a journey immediately. A journey that would keep her away from Cambridge for the entire holidays. So what happened? James escaped when they left? No. The cupboard, once shut, could only be opened from the outside. If he screamed for help to be let out, no one heard them, or if they did, no one came to his aid. Oh gosh, so what happened to Elizabeth and the master when they returned? They found his body still in the cupboard? Nobody dared open the cupboard for fear of what they would find, and then be accused of a horrific crime. He might not have died already. Elizabeth could not take the strain of the cover-up and the loss of her love. She died within a few months of their return. Still, the cupboard remained unopened. No one would dare to suggest that the master had anything to do with James's disappearance. What, they never opened it? Nope. Five years later, a broken man, the master died. Upon his replacement, the new master opened the cupboard. And what do you think he found? James's skeleton? No. Really? He'd escaped? No, no, they found his skeleton. Oh, Oh, I thought this was going to be a Romeo and Juliet in reverse for a moment then. No, James had been rotting in the cupboard for five years. Oh, macabre. That reminds me of another story of a skeleton in a cupboard, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. At Clare College, there was a Dr Green who was a contemporary of Sir Isaac Newton. He had a strange request that upon his death, his body would be dissected and his skeleton placed on display in a cupboard in the library. They're quite weird, these academics, aren't they? Yes, I take it was a glass-fronted cupboard. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> yes, what's the point? Oh, yes, yeah. so why could I open up that book, I suppose? However, his family thought this mad, mm. and when he did die in 1730, they buried him in a conventional manner. Twelve years later, though, Clare College thought that honouring Dr Green's request would be a good thing to do after all. I expect there's probably some money in it there somewhere. Yes. So, what, they dug him up and stuck him in a cupboard on display? No. What? Not quite. No one knew where he was buried, so they found an appropriate donor skeleton and displayed it, in not in the library, but by the hall staircase. I'm so sorry, did you say a donor skeleton? Yes. What, what was it dug up? Did, what, they, they asked a morgue? Or, what did they do? Did they appeal to the town for someone to donate their skeleton? Probably a leftover from the medical school cadavers. I don't know. Anyway, the skeleton went missing over time. Over time? Yes. Bone by bone. Oh, right. Students taking souvenirs. It is said that Dr Green was so upset by the whole affair that he haunted the grounds of the college on Christmas Eve in the hope that he would find the bones of his own skeleton. Ah, I see. Well, it must have taken a while, especially if those uh, that took them had moved away. Exactly. So we venture to Sydney Sussex College, where just after Halloween in 1967, some very spooky events took place. A student called John Emsley went to see his friend Peter, who lodged at Chapel Court. 
Peter wasn't in, so John entered the room and waited for him. John began to feel a presence in the room, and then saw a shape forming in the air. He became overwhelmingly cold, and he found it difficult to breathe. Then a large mouth began to materialise in the room. What? A yes. large mouth? A large mouth began to materialise in the room into what John described as the most terrifying spectacle of his life. It grew from a mouth into a pale, yellow, emancipated head floating in midair. What did he do? Run, I hope. Indeed, it took him a moment to overcome his petrifying fear and breathlessness to exit the room. Some time later, Peter came back and noticed an odd smell, like rotting flesh. Soon, John caught up with Peter to tell of his frightening experience. They left, fearful, and did not return that night. In the room above was a student called Michael. The following afternoon, his fiancée, Linda, was lying on a bed when she noticed the oddest thing. I'm nervous to ask, but what was it? <laughs> it was a large purple eye floating in mid-air by the door. Oh, my word. <laughs> she stood up and carefully walked around, expecting it to be a trick of the lights and vanished. She's an old lass, isn't she? Indeed. <laughs> but it did not. It stayed pulsating for the next ten minutes. Yow. After which, Linda, unnerved, left the room. The eye was seen by other students in the college, and then the activity ceased. But she was, I mean... I, I, I would be a little bit more than unnerved. I, well, that would you been, don't know how you'd react, but that's that true. sounds... I suppose if she thought, well, it's, oh, how, you know, it's very much a trick of the light type of thing. That's and really, it was in the afternoon, isn't it? Because we yeah. always think of spooky things happening at night. Yes, but they're a large purple eye. Anyway, so, um, actually, it reminds me of a case in Mexico from a book that I read called Serpent of the Light Beyond 2012. Well, I know I read some rubbish, but it was quite good rubbish. I'll link it to the, in the show notes. Anyway, a chap called Dranvello, who was the, the author of the book, he was on a psychic quest to balance the male and female energies of the world. I love that. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. Just go with me on this one for a moment. Is this fiction? It's meant to be. Uh, not. It is actually meant to be true. Right. You know, the John Velo has said that you know he's not saying it's a fictional story. He's saying that he did actually go. He, to he did on go on this. Male. Excellent. Yes. Good man. That's right. Uh, he was still right. got some work to do. <laughs> yes. Uh, very much so. So, um, as I was saying, yeah, on a psychic quest, balance male and female allergies around the world, and he'd just been on a visit to one of the Mayan pyramids, Palenque. He had gone to bed and had woken in the middle of the night. Something had pulled him out of his deep sleep. He looked around the room, and there above him was an enormous golden eye blinking at him. Oh, my word. It was six feet across and about four feet high. Oh, it was an enormous eye. It really was. It wasn't, yeah, absolutely. He was so used to psychic phenomena by this stage of his journey that he was intrigued and wanted to understand it rather than being terrified. Gosh. A male voice spoke to him, and he recognised the voice as that of Khan Kara. Who was, uh, which was a voice that had spoken to him earlier in the chapter. Right. And Khan Khan was the architect of the Mayan uh, pyramid at Chichen Itza. They had a chat until his companion for the journey, Ken, entered the room and totally freaked out. He saw it too? Yes. You know that scene in Friends when Joey comes in when Monica's wearing the turkey on her head? Yes. Well, that reaction times about a hundred and you're roughly where Ken was, seeing the giant golden eye floating in the middle of the room. Eventually, Dranvalo calmed Ken down and he was able to settle him down to sleep. That sounds utterly fantastical, <laughs> if I'm going to have to say. Well, that's par for the course. For the How could you ever be calm after seeing that? And then, well, that's par for the course for the Serpent of Light beyond 2012. We move on to Trinity College, the largest of Cambridge colleges founded by King Henry VIII when he mushed together, is it Michaelhouse or Micklehouse? Micklehouse. Yeah, Micklehouse and King's Hall together to form Trinity. Famous alumni are Sir Isaac Newton, Lord Byron, Niels Bohr, Francis Bacon, Martin Rees, and Guy Burgess and Kim Philby, of course. So, all the white blokes? Yes, all the clever white blokes. Okay. And it's indeed, there's still a long way to go there. 
Although there is a smattering of ghosts seen in the college, it is more famous for the ghost and paranormal societies that it has produced. The Ghost Club was formed and reformed about four times, lastly by Harry Price, who is most famous for documenting the Borley Rectory case. Ah, we're back to the Borley Rectory case. Indeed we are said to be the most haunted house in England, at least until it was demolished in 1944. The rectory became famous after Harry Price's books on accounts of the paranormal activity that occurred there. Hauntings had been occurring since 1863, but became more pronounced in 1900, when daughters of the rector at the time saw an apparition of a nun near the house. They tried to talk to it, but it disappeared. They do tend to be introverted. Those nun ghosts don't. <laughs> they do, yes. Also, members of Trinity College formed the Society for Psychical Research, or SPR, with the aim of turning the investigation of psychic phenomena into a respectable academic discipline by scientific study. They decided to do a research project on Harry Price's findings at Borley Rectory and rejected most of the sightings as either imaginary or fabricated greatly affecting his credibility. Didn't they also research the case of the Enfield poltergeist? Guy Lyon Playfair? An ordinary council house in Enfield, North London, which experienced traumatic poltergeist events over a period of about 18 months in the late 1970s. Yes, yes, that's right. And there were some great accounts of this case, an excellent film by the BBC and also a great account by the Bazaar podcast. And not forgetting the Unexplained podcast with Howard Hughes. If you want to look for yourselves, the archives of the SPR can be found in the Cambridge University Library. Another famous Trinity white bloke was T.C. Lethbridge. He was an alumni of Trinity, having enrolled in 1923 to study geography and geology. Geology, which he found, to quote, crushingly dull. Oh dear. Well, having done geology A-level, I can concur, it does have its dull moments, often one after the other for quite some time. Oh dear. He came back to Cambridge and wheedled his way into becoming Keeper of Anglo-Saxon Antiquities at Cambridge University Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. He gained quite a reputation as a go-getting archaeologist and was part of expeditions to Greenland and Iceland, even one looking at cosmic radiation at high altitudes in the 1930s. He postulated that maybe Columbus wasn't the first to get to America and that North Europeans had done it centuries earlier. However, his reputation diminished when he claimed to have found three large chalk figures at Wandlebury Hill, just down the road in Gog and Magog Hills, outside Cambridge. If you're in the area, by the way, do go to Wandlebury Country Park. It's absolutely delightful. Iron Age fort, everything. He believed he had found a warrior, a hooded goddess, and a sun god, but these were scoffed on by the Cambridge establishment. His career took a turn to the alternative, and he is now someone with a cult following due to his beliefs on the paranormal. Oh yeah, such as? Well, his first book in his alternative career was Ghost and Ghoul in 1961, arguing that mind and brain were separate. He became interested in witches, dowsing, ESP, and that aliens had interfered with human evolution. By the time of his death in 1971, he had concluded, and I quote, from a three-dimensional world, I seem to have fallen through into one where there are more dimensions." End quote. He became a cult hero to the likes of Colin Wilson, who we have mentioned before in The Black Monk of Pontefract, and also the musician and antiquarian Julian Cope. Now, back to Gog Magog Hills, which fascinated T.C. Lethbridge so much. Aren't Gog and Magog giants? Yes. I thought they were originally from the Bible in Ezekiel and in the Book of Revelations. Fearsome mm -hmm. giants they were. The legend in England is that they are the last of a race of giants who once lived here in Britain. Looking at the map of folklore and superstition by Marvellous Maps, there is a trail of Gog and Magog from East London to Cambridge and then following the St Michael Ley Line down to Devon, where it takes a short detour to Totnes, where Brutus or Cornelius in Cornwall uh, is said to have defeated them, depending on which version of the legend you read. Anyway, ghosts. Wandlebury has a cracker. Oh yeah. It is said by Gervais of Tilbury, born in the 12th century, that if a knight enters Wandlebury at the dead of night, when the moon is shining, and calls, Knight to knight, come forth, a phantom knight appears on horseback and charges. 
one of the two will be overthrown. Ooh, and has this been tested? Yes. A knight called Osbert Fitzhugh. Was... Excellent name. Oh, it is, isn't it? If we have a dog. Osbert. Yes. Uh, anyway, Osbert Fitzhugh was staying in Cambridge and he had heard the tale, so decided to test it out. He rode the four miles to Wandlebury and called forth, Knight to knight, come forth. The phantom knight appeared and charged. However, Osbert was able to unhorse the knight and decided to take the horse as his prize. The phantom was not done and threw his lance, piercing Osbert in the side. Osbert returned to Cambridge a hero. However, by the morning, the horse had vanished and on the anniversary of his victory, his wound would bleed. Oh my. Recently, a man visiting Wandlebury was told by the warden, a man named Bill Clark, of the tale of the phantom knight and horse. The man was amused. Not long after, he came running back to Bill in terror, saying that he had heard and seen a horse rush by him. Another story in Wandlebury is that of a party of school children who were on a day trip to Wandlebury when a 12-year-old girl began to scream. She said a man in funny clothes had walked around a bush and stood staring at her. A teacher vouched that this girl was truthful and no fantasist. Later that day, when visiting the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, the 12-year-old girl pointed out a model of a Roman soldier as being like the man who had frightened her. So, there we go. Another spooky tale. An excellent one. Indeed. So do go and read the books by Robert Halliday, Alan Murdy and Jeff Yates. There's lots more there to uncover. There will be links in the show notes. If you've enjoyed this spooky tale, please do tell others and leave us a review. It really helps other people who might enjoy it find our podcast. Thank you. Please do tell us your spooky tales, either in the YouTube comments or... Via email, which is the spooky tales podcast, or one word at gmail.com and come and follow us on Instagram at the Spooky Tales Podcast. Or why not visit us on our Facebook page at Spooky Tales. Thanks again. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.